Good afternoon, and welcome to another one of our sessions in this series. As you know, we are make the observation that the world is changing rapidly and radically. And the problem of governance is very much a part of that. Demographics, technology, and cutting through it is climate change and the potential of the spread of nuclear weapons. So we have big problems on our hands. We're trying to understand them better. As you know, we've had a session on impact on Russia, on China. <clears throat> we had one on the impact of the information age on governance. And today we've been spending the morning and the afternoon talking about developments in Latin America, which we'll go over here. But let me just tell you, we, we have uh, sessions all through the year next year. And the first three will be on January 14th, we'll have one on Africa. And on February 4th, we'll have one on Europe. And on February 24th, we'll have one on the national security implications of the new technology. So that starts our year. So Pedro Aspe, former uh, Minister of Finance of Mexico, and an old friend, we share having a PhD in economics from MIT. That's the gold standard, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, he has put this together and he will share the session. Pedro, take over. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you very much. We are delighted uh, to be here. Let me introduce um, to your right um, Ernesto Silva, who is um, visiting here in Hoover and who is um, uh, um, who has been in his career member of Congress of the Chilean Congress uh, from Chile and um, and um, and um, a friend uh, who is going to talk uh, first about the overview of what's going on in Latin America. Then um, uh, next is, um, is um, Claudia Ferrer, Mr. Mas Ferrer, uh, who is uh, a demographer and uh, who is going to talk to us of, about what's going on on, uh, on demography, fertility rates, mortality rates, etc., cetera, in, um, in Mexico and in the Northern Triangle. The Northern Triangle of Central America is Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Uh, and um, as you have heard in the last weeks, the caravans and all these things, well, that's exactly what she does, and, uh, and, and she, she will explain uh, this to us. Then, um, uh, to, uh, to the left, uh, Richard Eitenhead. Richard has a very distinguished career in Guatemala. Uh, he was uh, Secretary of Treasury. And after Secretary of Treasury, uh, like a decade later, he was um, with, um, with a Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, Menchu, and Richard were the, the guys who, got, who brought peace to Guatemala. So on his own right, uh, um, uh, someone very distinguished of uh, Central America. And finally, to, to the, in the stream left for you, Benjamin Sigulka, who is an entrepreneur, who is a graduate from, uh, from Stanford, from Guatemala, and who will explain to us with Richard what they are doing in the middle of all these crises to create jobs in Central America. So um, let's start then with uh, Ernesto Silva to give us the overview uh, of, um, of uh, Latin America. Ernesto, por favor. Thank you very much, Pedro. And also, I want to thank Secretary Schultz and Jim Timby for organizing this program of different meetings to analyze the challenges of the governance for the new world. I think for Latin America, we have a lot of challenges. I wrote a paper that tries <coughs> to address the general uh, context of Latin America. And we had a wonderful discussion this morning about this paper and others. And one of the points that was made during this morning was that it's difficult 
to have a general perspective of a continent or a region with such a diversity of realities that we are facing in each of the countries. So I, I will go on giving a general perspective, but probably many in the audience are going to think about the reality of its own country. And that can have an impact in the general per perspective. In my view, what I see is that Latin America is in a moment of fragile stability. <coughs> It is true that we have a lot of problems. Still, we have a lot of problems, mainly in terms of the quality of the institutions. But if we go back 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, we were a continent with only a few countries run under a democratic system. If we look now, we have only a few exceptions, but most of the countries are run under democratic system. And it is true that many of the Latin American countries are facing relevant problems within their democracies. But if you take the evolution over years and decades, there is an improvement in terms of democracy and the quality of institutions. Second, if you take a look at the economic progress, the continent has been growing, but slower than the rest of the world. During the super cycle of the commodities in the early 2000s, there was a better performance for the continent. And that helped in many cases to improve the development of, so of social programs in order to enlarge the access for education and healthcare and other initiatives. And after that, the pace has been slower. We keep growing, <coughs> but at a slower rate. Again, when you look at the continent, as one issue, as one picture, you have an average growth higher than 1.2% for the year. But at the same time, if you look at different countries, you will see that Venezuela is decreasing by 18% this year. So having a general view is challenging when you have very diverse realities in each of the countries of the continent. But again, if we take a 30-year perspective, we're doing better in terms of economic progress and also in terms of social policy. Moving to social policy, we were discussing in the morning that not all results uh, are equivalent for all countries in the region, Mexico, Central America, and others. But in terms of reducing poverty, the continent is doing better. In some of the countries, many of them, I would say, we are facing an increase of the middle class, and that's having a different impact in the way citizens interact with government. And that's posing new challenges for governance that I think should be addressed and debated here and elsewhere. If, you, if we also take a look of demographics, the continent is facing different realities, but there's a decline in the fertility rate. We see some trends in aging population, and that will pose some challenges also for the labor market. Uh, as we will see some decades of increase of the labor force, but then a decrease in some years by 2030 or 50. And this creates an environment where the fragility of the institutions are still a central issue for the continent. The colonial state or system was replaced in the early 19th century based mainly on the idea of caudillos and leaders instead of solid and grounded institutions. I think that matters because citizens and the population used to expect solutions coming from a savior instead of looking for institutions well organized through different institutional mechanisms. Maybe that explains why we have more than 360 successful coups in the continent over these centuries and more than 250 constitutions for the region. That's a lot of instability. So, but now, I think that we have enough arguments to think that we can look with a rational optimism for the future. It's true that we have challenges in several countries, but it's also true that the, we have more democracy, we have economic growth, we have social inclusion, that it's different now from what happened a couple of decades ago. So I think we are in reasonable conditions for addressing the challenges of governance for the future. 
Two things that I wanted to point out before finishing this introduction, introduction is that we can have a picture of the continent as a general picture, but we cannot address policies as a general picture. We should go in different approaches to every country because the problems are different. And we have to be very careful with the idea of getting general policies for the entire continent instead of identifying the reality of the local program that each country has. And just to finish this introduction, I think that the digital transformation, that's one of the challenges posed for us to debate, offers a wonderful opportunity for the continent. There are different areas where the digital transformation can be taken by the continent, and I would like to mention just a couple of examples. FinTech, in terms of increasing the possibility of citizens to get access to banking and payment system, it's a wonderful opportunity to increase and and to get more people participating not only in social development but also in the economic activity of the region. Second, in terms of e-health, uh, pro healthcare provision in a population that is aging, where you have a lot of new technology, 3D printing, precision <coughs> medicine, better diagnoses, it's a wonderful opportunity that must be taken in, in the continent. Smart cities, we have and we were discussing during the morning, Pedro, and it was pointed out that the reality in each country is different, but in Latin America as a continent, today 80% of the population lives in cities. That creates a very good opportunity to work in the idea of smart cities, introducing technology to do more on traffic, uh, crime, uh, and different systems of coordination within the cities and access to benefits uh, from the government. In addition to that, uh, citizens in Latin America still spend a lot of time in government procedures or red tape. Going digital uh, in the interaction between citizens and the government, it's a great opportunity to be more efficient, to reduce the risks of corruption, and to facilitate the participation of the population in the real life. Finally, a couple of challenges. One that was pointed out this morning we still have a lot of violence. We still have a lot of violence in the continent. And there is a question, and the most probable answer is that a relevant part of that violence is related to drugs. So one question for the future is how to address that challenge and which could be the role of the United States in that relationship with the continent. And that's a huge challenge that was pointed out this morning during the debate. The second one is cybersecurity. It's true that the access to the internet, internet of things, and access to different kinds of technologies is increasing in the continent, but, but still we're facing the risk of cybersecurity because we're not very well prepared for that. So we need more technology, human capital, and training in order to be prepared to address the challenges that more innovation and technology brings to the continent. And third, I would like to point out one final point related to the challenges of social media for democracy and from, for the liberation. I, my paper opens with mentioning that the first statement from Jair Bolsonaro, the new president of Brazil, and maybe some people here from Brazil can explain in more detail, his first statement was not on TV or radio, it was on Facebook Live. During this morning, it was mentioned that he didn't go to a TV debate or different instances, but he used social network to run his campaign, and he was able to get elected in the largest country in the continent. And so we are facing new challenges in terms of technology and social networks. And that's a wonderful opportunity for the participation of the people in the deliberation process, but there are also some risks. Let me point out two of them. First, democracy is a process of interaction and negotiation where you are exposed to different ideas. Social media, social network, and the algorithm <coughs> and segmentation that are related with social media are avoiding that interaction and are creating small groups where 
your own ideas are being reinforced. So there is a risk of not listening, not exchanging ideas, and not having space to find some common ground. The second risk that I find, and it's also an opportunity, and it's a challenge for representative democracy, is that social networks and political interactions in that space used to be a kind of plebiscitarian system, yes or no. And real life, it's more complex than that. You have to find spaces or systems where most of the population can agree to something, even if they don't like that. So I am, I finish saying that I'm a rational optimist, that the diversity of the problems of the countries, it's very relevant, but still we're doing a slow progress, and that there are very important challenges for governance that I think we have the opportunity to leapfrog and get on them. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Let me shift now to Central America, to uh, this called Northern Triangle of Central America, composed by these three countries, Guatemala in the border with Mexico, and then Honduras and El Salvador. So Richard and Ben, um, this symposium is, uh, is uh, centered in to the big technological change that is happening, and if we are going to <laughs> displace jobs or not, what are we going to do with uh, all this technological change? Richard, why don't you start saying, uh, do you face a dilemma? How do you pose the dilemma? <clears throat> okay, we, we thought that, for example, Central America is facing even greater challenges that the whole Latin America region in terms of rule of law, in terms of fighting impunity and corruption, in terms of making that our population uh, believes and thinks that democracy is working well, uh, in tra taking care of education and health in our countries. And also, we have been growing the middle class in the urban areas but still we are lacking that progress in most of the rural areas of our countries. So we are in a big process, but we thought that coming here and having today the opportunity to discuss how digital transformation is going to change our countries, we were not going to go through the traditional approach of what governments can do in Central America, but how we can use digital transformation to try to change things in the community base, thinking about the average citizens in our communities. So that's the approach and it's something that already Ben is doing in the region and we are promoting with small results up to now, but with very promising uh, possibilities for the future. So I would let Ben to explain what's the model that we are trying to promote in terms of using digital transformation to empower our average citizen in Central America. Ben. By the way, uh, just uh, to introduce you, Ben. Ben is a graduate from, uh, from Stanford College, so he's very happy to be back on campus. Yes. Ben. Long time ago. Um, it doesn't look like it, but it was. Um, so it, we find it helpful to think of the average citizen in Central America. The average citizen, um, 73 70% of the economy is informal, so the average citizen is completely isolated from the social security system. Um, they're, they're not earning minimum wage, they're earning way less than minimum wage, uh, typically maybe 50%, 40%, 60% of minimum wage. Um, the average citizen never finished high school, so 60, you know, two thirds finish primary school, but only one third finish secondary school, and only somewhere between five and 10% go to college. Um, so the question is, in that reality, how do you create employment? How do you create opportunities? And, and there's a model that we've been working on for decades in, in many parts of the world uh, to create employment. And, and it's a model that basically says government should invest in infrastructure, um, in health and education, and government should attract investment. And investment should, should, uh, should go to large companies and medium companies and small companies, and they should all be suppliers. <laughs> and to each other, et cetera, um, and that will create jobs. But the problem in Central America is that that model has not really worked. 
It hasn't worked for, for four critical reasons. The first is that there are very weak institutions, which Ernesto was mentioning. Um, so there's so much corruption and, and so much red tape that really large companies or foreign direct investment can't really operate very well in that context. Um, the second reason is infrastructure is so bad uh, that they, at the ports, at the roads, at the airports level, um, that logistics costs are super high, so you're not really competitive anymore uh, with the rest of the, of the region. The third is that there's so much violence, crime and theft, some of it drug-related. There's a lot of extortions um, and a lot of robberies as well. Um, in the double digits, uh, percentages of, of businesses have to deal with this. Um, so that, that adds an extra cost, which, which decreases your competitiveness. And the fourth is that your, your talent pool is really not that educated. And so it's, uh, it, it, there's a lot of unemployability. So the question for us became, what is the best model um, to, to, to generate income in that prof um, profile of a population? And what will digital do this? Is digital going to make it worse or is it going to make, make it better? And, and, and it's, it, it could go either way. I mean, it could make it a lot worse, a lot more marginalization, particularly if you look at a lot of the jobs that there are today um, are in cutting coffee uh, or cutting uh, sugar cane. Um, uh, there's you know, some call center jobs, et cetera. A lot of these jobs will disappear over the next, uh, at, at least 100,000 jobs will disappear just in sugarcane in the, in the next decade um, as, as the economics of automating make it very, very clear that you have to automate. Um, otherwise, you're not competitive. So what are you left, what, what, that, what will that population be able to do? What's the transition plan for them? Um, now, we think our hypothesis is that digital will not necessarily marginalize. Um, it could go that way, but if we channel it correctly, it can actually empower the population. Um, and the way we're viewing this is if you, if you grab your average citizen who, who's in the profile we mentioned earlier, um, they need access to health, education, uh, mobility, transportation, protection, safety, basic services like water, electricity, uh, telephony, et cetera. Um, the, the, the hypothesis we have is that the best way for them to meet these needs is through self-employment platforms. So instead of relying on big business and investment to do it, it's relying on the citizens themselves to supply themselves with the services through self-employment platforms. Now, what are self-employment platforms? Um, Uber is one, right? An average citizen is, is giving somebody else a service of transportation. Um, Airbnb is another more oriented towards tourism. But there are lots of other ones that go beyond marketplaces. Micro franchises are self-employment platforms. You can set up a hot dog stand. You can set up a hair salon. Um, uh, catalog sales are self-employment platforms where women are selling to other women cosmetics um, or housewares. And you also have um, supply on the production side. We have a lot of exports, um, agricultural exports. You have supply chain incubation. So you help farmers produce uh, specialty coffee and then that exports. And so you're incubating the production cycle um, that, that, that way. And that, that generates self-employment for the producer. So the big potential we see is that for the first time in history, you can actually generate self-employment in a way that is scalable, in a way that the cost of onboarding people to self-employment self platforms is lower, training them is lower, and controlling and operating these, these is a lot lower. So you can manage 10,000 Uber drivers at scale, which is something that you couldn't do before. You can, mon you can manage 1,000 micro-franchises at scale uh, with AI algorithms and cameras and, and ERPs and um, so what we're doing is exactly that. We're building a self-employment platform system for the region, uh, primarily focused on, on micro-franchises, but also on marketplaces, uh, particularly like, you know, uh, the electrician comes to your house and repairs. So Uber-like platforms for electricians, for, uh, for delivery, et cetera. And the advantage of, of, of generating income in this particular way is that it's a lot more aligned with the reality of the region. 70% of your market is, is there, and they're already doing it. They already do a gig economy since a long time ago, but it, it, was, it was a gig economy that didn't have so much transparency, had a lot of arbitrage. So you're able to go from, I have nothing to, I have my own business in maybe two to three, four, five, six months, um, because the training, you don't need that much training. Um, financial institutions benefit too, because you're de-risking de the credits to, to, to start a business. 
it, uh, you can offer half the interest rate because it's a dearest. You can um, the, b enroll big companies, both for, for consumer and for exports. Um, and then the government benefits quite a bit because you can do the taxation at the platform level instead of doing it at the, um, at the individual entrepreneur level, which is exactly what Uber does um, or, or what we're doing um, in the region. We, we facilitate the whole taxation process. Um, so you manage to create a culture of form formalization. There's, there's still really big structural challenges that obviously aren't solved by this model. We're calling it the SEPI model, uh, Self-Employed Platform-Enabled Entrepreneurs. So SEPIs won't solve everything. But what you're doing is you're creating pockets of solutions. So where you have very weak institutions, SEPIs won't solve that. But where you have a low tax collection, which is the lowest, um, uh, very, very, very low, you're able to increase the tax base. Where you have um, a lot of corruption and, and, and mistrust, you're creating parallel trust systems that work. Um, and where you have uh, a lot of polarization and special interests, you're, you're able to sort of democratize. You're moving people from employees to owners of their own business. And so that creates a, a new dynamic that's, that's different than the left versus right polarization um, that has been there, that's been there historically. Um, so that's a little bit of what we're doing and, and, and what the future we see to have digital transformation in Central America be more of an empowerment vehicle than a marginalization tool. OK, thank you very much, uh, uh, Richard and Ben. Now we come uh, finally to demographer Claudia Masferrer, who is going to talk about uh, the demographics of Mexico uh, and the demographics of the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Claudia. Thank you, Pedro. Um, thank you for, for being here. And I would like to start by thanking uh, Pedro and Secretary Schultz for, for inviting us two years ago for this project, uh, to work on this project. It has been very, very exciting, and uh, it's, a, it's an honor to come back. Um, two things before starting. Um, <clears throat> when we uh, prepared a migration system in the making, a document that you can, you can check online, um, two years ago, we were really excited to think about the past, kind of like making a revision about immigration policies and demographic dynamics and trends and patterns to see whether or not there was a mismatch between policy and trends, and of course there is a mismatch. Um, but it was also very important to think on the future. And I think today in the discussion it was very clear that we need more um, places like this to actually discuss future um, possibilities and challenges and also opportunities. So when we were looking back then about the future and projections, it was very clear that migration uh, is the demographic component that is always harder to predict. So fertility and mortality are uh, a little bit more certain. Um, but this actually gave, gave us the opportunity to think a lot about the different challenges. Uh, now, in the current paper that uh, was prepared uh, with uh, Silvia Jarguli, who's here present, and Victor Garcia Guerrero, who couldn't join us, uh, he's also a professor as me in, at Colegio de Mexico, um, what we wanted to do this time was a revision not on the immigration policies and the mismatch between the demographic dynamics, but look a little bit further about the changes and the trends in population dynamics. So we started with fertility. And when you look at the four countries of the region that we call Mexico and the Northern Triangle of Central America, it's very clear that they differ in size. So you have Mexico with 125 million and the three countries of Central America together, 30 million less than the population of Canada. Um, and of course, these countries are going to grow in the future, but the rate at which they are growing is actually declining and mainly driven by a decrease in fertility rates among all the three, uh, the four countries, where Guatemala is going at a slower rate. Um, and you actually see that this has an impact in the population structure. So there is going to be a decline in the younger ages of 0 to 15. And there's going to be an increase of the older ages population in, I mean, in the future. And this is not new. As, as we, we all know, the whole world is going through an aging process. Latin America is going through the same process. And there's four countries as well. Uh, but what's interesting is that one of the things that we highlight in the report is that 
<clears throat> these changes of an aging society are happening at the same time as there are different challenges for the youth. So the youth are going through, um, especially for the men, uh, they're imp being affected by violence and homicide rates that have been increasing, but they're also uh, affecting women, um, not only life expectancy, but also with young uh, fertility among uh, young women and teenage pregnancy. Um, and kind of like in a context where there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of inequality, lack of uh, job opportunities in many cases, and just like a feeling of unrest between the youth. We see that in terms of mortality, there has been an improvement in life expectancy, and this has been driven by a reduction in infant mortality as well as better health in the long run. Now, unfortunately, we do see a big decline in the, around the 1990s, for example, in, in male life expectancy that was driven by uh, violence and, and civil war uh, in El Salvador. And we see that in Mexico, um, recently there has also been an impact, a negative impact of violence and security and war-related violence in male life expectancy as well as female life expectancy. Now, the data does not allow us to see exactly what has been happening in Central America more recently, but we would expect that given that homicide rates have been much, much, much higher, and we also show that uh, in the other Central American countries that, I mean, we would expect a similar negative effect. And today we mentioned that, for example, the recent decline in, in life expectancy that has been observed here in the United States is a product of drug consumption, whereas in the other countries we actually see an effect because of war of drugs um, and all the implications that these have. Uh, something we discussed today was actually the impacts of violence, and here I would like to say that violence has an impact in mortality that is very direct, but it also has an impact in kind of like looking for the future and the job opportunities that this population have. Um, there has been an increase in emigration due to violence and displacement. And unfortunately, in the case of Central America, this is not something new. Uh, we all know that political instability, civil war, coup d'etat, were actually drivers for migration from the region since the 1980s. And although there have been different moments and different waves uh, <clears throat> in the different Central American countries, it's really, really a, a constant. Now, one of the main messages that I want you to take today is that um, although in demographic indicators these four countries look similar, in terms of migration, they look very different. So today, Mexican migration to the United States is at its like, low, very low point. Um, although the flows from Central America have been increasing in recent years. Now, when you look at the numbers and the stocks, because the, flow, the stocks are the results of the flows over time, and Mexico-US migration has a long history and a lot of exchange, um, you see that around 12 million Mexicans live here in the United States, but half of the population is undocumented. Um, half of the Mexican undocumented population has been living here more than 15 years. Uh, so it's not a recent arrival population, whereas in, 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 in Central America you actually see that this relative increase in recent years is also um, showing longer durations of stay. Now, we, when I say that there was a big change in Mexican-US migration, it's not something new. So, 10 years ago you see a decline, huge decline in net migration, um, whereas before we used to lose around 3 million in, like, in the maximum uh, in a five-year period, we actually see a complete drop, mainly driven by the effects of economic hardship due to the uh, recession in 2008, the Great Recession, and the crisis, uh, but also because there was a huge increase of deportations and involuntary return. And this is not something new. This didn't happen with uh, President Trump. This actually happened with uh, President Obama, so more than 2 million Mexicans were deported in the six fiscal years of his administration. Uh, and when you add up with the 1.8 millions that were deported during the well, removed, not border apprehensions, but re deportations from the interior uh, from President Bush administration, you actually see that um, this huge amount of 
Mexicans that went back to Mexico, uh, along with their family members, along with US-born children. Uh, just a very important fact is that uh, half a million US-born children live today in Mexico, mostly with Mexican parents. Uh, but this also tells us about how uh, <clears throat> Mexican migration has changed and has created new links and new networks between populations both in Mexico and the United States. We usually mention that this population is a population that we share. It's a group that has potentially dual citizenship and that uh, will, I mean, might come back to the United States to study to work, it's uncertain, but it has definitely changed a lot the way that we see family networks, social networks. And when you think about the reasons for migration of this recent migrant caravan, for example, from Central America, and you think about what happened in 2014 with the crisis of unaccompanied minors, and you think about what has been happening in the last 30 years, it's very clear that um, the drivers for migration continue to be political instability, violence, and just like getting out of uh, gangs and homicide, uh, I mean, the risks of homicides. But you also see family reunification, again, with large amounts of the population living here. So just something to, to remember is that 22% of the population that is from El Salvador is living today in the United States. For the Mexican population, it's about 10%. Uh, but you actually see that these countries have a large shares of their population living abroad, mainly in the United States. So, I mean, it's a, it's a very complex situation. Um, in the paper, we highlight two challenges. First of all, violence, <clears throat> the impact in mortality and life expectancy, but also just in social unrest and the social context. And then migration, which again, I mean, it's hard to predict, but uh, we do think that we need to, to revise a little bit of what we were uh, studying in the previous paper on the policies and what and the responses should be both from the origin countries and from the destination countries, except that Mexico is, uh, has a very unique, complex role in the system in the, because we are a country of immigration, of immigration, we're receiving foreign-born, but we're also a country of return. Uh, so return migration has put lots of, lots of challenges. And increasingly, transit migration and refugee and asylum is definitely something that we will need to discuss and to reform in our policies and also in trying to integrate migrants to Mexico. Thank you, Claudia. Let me uh, uh, ask a, a question to each of the, of the panel uh, members. Um, I start with you, Ernesto. Ernesto, you, you come from Chile. Uh, Chile has the highest per capita income of all Latin America. They, they have a very good economy. Uh, economy which is growing presently around 5% uh, with very low uh, unemployment. You are a, a role model for many of us. Um, however, even though you have uh, reduced to a minimum extreme poverty, which is one of the great, great features of uh, the, Chile, uh, the management of the Chilean economy, however, you have had a lot of problems with the new middle class like students, what's going on there? Uh, can you explain to us? Uh, we envy you, you know, you have brought uh, up uh, income, etc. Explain to us how, how you reconcile both things. I think, Pedro, that in the big picture, Chile is doing very well. As you mentioned, GDP per capita is the highest in the region. In terms of human development index, also we are number one in the region. And there are other indicators that shows that the country is doing well. And maybe the reasons are different, but are related to opening the economy, created, creating good institutions. Uh, we have a strong president, but we have a lot of check and balances, bicameral Congress, a Comptroller General, an independent judiciary, a constitutional court, a free media that is able to challenge uh, bad decisions. And we have been able to do progress over time. If, if you Consider that in 1990, we had only 200,000 or 250,000 people in higher education. We have now more than 1.2 million. That's a relevant change. And all those improvements are also related to a new group that is participating more actively in the society. And I think that both 
the business sector and the governments are not responding fast enough to those challenges. And maybe that's one component general to Latin America, in my view, that governments are not adapting enough to respond fast uh, to the needs of a changing demand in the population. I, I was mentioning this morning that during some decades, the challenge was to increase coverage in schooling. Now, at least in Chile, that we have almost 100% schooling, <coughs> and the challenge is to improve quality. And improving quality, it's really difficult. So the kind of challenges that we have now are different. And we are now growing at a good pace. 4% this year, 36 for next or something in between. But also we had four years where our growth rate was less than 2%. So when you want to move faster in this kind of challenges that the middle class are posing, uh, you need to keep running. And that's a huge challenge uh, for a country or for every country. The other thing that I, that I would mention is that since citizens are participating more actively, maybe not necessarily voting, uh, but yes, in the deliberation, in the social network, in the way they feel they can approach and address their leaders. It's more an horizontal kind of relationship instead of a vertical one that we used to have before that generates an environment of more complaint. Even though I don't feel that it necessarily connect with what's happening in the reality. But I am, <coughs> again, optimistic with the future because I think we have the grounds in order to move forward. Thank you, Ernesto. Let me turn now to Richard and, uh, and Ben. Um, Richard, how much of the violence uh, in Honduras and, uh, and Guatemala is um, because of the drug of the war on drugs on the U.S. <clears throat> okay, I would say that for almost all Central America, the political violence has decreased a lot, and since the signing of the peace accords in Guatemala, there has not been a, a political a persecution of, of leaders of any kind of, of political parties. But what is increasing is the violence that comes from drug dealers. Um, they have been using, when <coughs> Colum the Plan Colombia uh, was developed, most of the, um, of, of the shipping of the drugs moved to Central America. And Honduras and Guatemala, we have um, large rural areas where we are lacking the basic roads that we need, the infrastructure, that is needed. So for them, it's quite easy to use some of the farms as the landing facilities for some of the planes, prepare everything there, and then see how they, in a large border that we have with Mexico, they introduce it to Mexico and comes to here. But the problem is some of this drug is, is paid to the locals in drugs. So that's increasing consumption in our countries, it's increasing violence, and, and it's becoming a real program, problem. I, I think that what's going on in, in the Northern Triangle is that we have a young population that still is growing because we still are countries that the population is growing. Second, if we don't address the issue of roads that we need and basic infrastructure, it's nothing that we can do in the fight against drugs because you don't have the capacity to, to really fight against them. Just to make you an example, in Central America, in the United States, you have 20 meters of roads for each citizen that lives in the United States. In the Northern Triangle, you have two meters, 10 times less, and are small countries. You should have more uh, facilities and more roads. So, one thing that is needed is you have least have to increase that to five or six meters per citizen. That would mean maybe 20, 25 billion dollars investment. That part can come from a private sector, part from the governments, but we would need a lot of financing facilities 
from the international institutions uh, in order to do that and do it in a way that is transparent, competitive, and uh, cost, pro cost efficient. So that's something that we would need if we want to fight that. Second is something that we would need if we want to stop pushing people outside our countries. Uh, in the case of El Salvador, because Salvador had the political violence higher during the 80s and early than the rest of the, the Central American countries in terms of, of, of being more related with the cities, they had a huge uh, immigration to the United States. They have one of each five uh, Salvadorians living in the United States. In Guatemala, we are still 6% only in the United States, and Honduras maybe would be 7%. But if nothing happens, it's going to be 10, 12%, and the problem is just going to grow. So the way of addressing the issue is basic. You have to create better government in our countries. And there have been fight in the last years, fighting against impunity, against corruption, and that has been a big change of what happened in the past. Of course, it's not easy, but it's happening in, in, in the Northern Triangle. Second, you need to... To, to have basic infrastructure. Uh, and third, you need to improve not just rule of law, but the institutional capacity of our societies to deal with our basic needs in health and education. But on the other end, we need some different approach, some micro solutions as the one that we are proposing now, because you cannot just believe that things are going to be changed by the governments and uh, by general agreements between countries, you need that the society starts to move in the direction of more trust, more relations, and that goes through working with the communities in things that can affect directly the life of the people that live in the communities. So let me, let me now come back to the drug problem in the US and, uh, and the impact it has had in Latin America, especially in Central America, Colombia, and Mexico. But now Brazil uh, has it too. Uh, Mr. Secretary, may I, may I call on you to tell us a story of a dialogue between Moynihan, a special advisor to the president on drugs <coughs> and yourself some years ago about the supply the supply side of the war on drugs in the U.S., and then we come back to Latin America. In the Nixon administration, the war on drugs started. And the idea was drugs are bad for you. So the way to keep people from taking them was to deny the supply. If they weren't there, you couldn't take them. So we had a supply-oriented approach. And one time, Pat Moynihan, later senator, was counselor in the White House, and he was a self-appointed drug czar. And he and I are riding up to Camp David. I'm director of the budget, so I've got a presentation to make. I'm studying my notes, and Pat's in a state of euphoria. He says, don't you understand? We had the biggest drug bust in history yesterday. I said, congratulations. But you don't get it. This was in Marseille. We've broken the French connection. I said, great work. <clears throat> there was a silence. And he said, I suppose you think that as long as there is a big profitable demand for drugs in the United States, there will be a supply. I said to Moynihan, there's hope for you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's been the story. If you try to uh, cure the problem by restricting supply, you, you lose. It just doesn't work. Secretary, can you tell and us? You, you say that anybody taking drugs gets thrown in jail, so our jails are full of young kids who took a drug. And what do you learn when you're in jail? You learn how to be a real criminal. So it's a big deal. But the drug dealers, then they get huge amounts of money from the drug trade here. And they buy the guns here, and they go down to Central America or Mexico or somewhere. They bribe officials. They use the guns creates violence, and it's a bad thing. So, Pedro, tell what you saw in Portugal is the way to get out there. <laughs> you see, did it, see, Pedro did it, and I, you know, we, we have a little end game going here. <laughs> yeah, one of the, of the big, big problems of, uh, of uh, just targeting the supply was 
that this was transferred out to the US, the production, and uh, then tiny little countries could not, uh, you know, uh, 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 face these things with uh, with the uh, drug barons uh, having money to buy the police and uh, to corrupt uh, everybody. So this is a problem. And nowadays, some countries, by the way, small countries have started to shift from the supply side to the demand side. They don't legalize drugs, but they decriminalize consumption, like the case of Portugal. And in Portugal, you, you shift the, the, the so-called war on drugs from only fighting the supply to saying, okay, we do have a problem. We do have a problem, and so let's take out this from the police into health public policy. And now the medical doctors are going to have the, the treatment centers in, uh, in Portugal, <coughs> and they are going to help these young men to, to, to go away, uh, away from the drug addiction. And this is the complete change. And this is something that is very, very interesting, is working very well. Portugal is an example of a huge reduction of demand. And this, of course, creates, a, creates a, a better future. So this is a, this is, this is a topic which, is, yes, it's a Mexican topic, it's a Salvadoran and Guatemalan topic, yes, but it has a link to the U.S., and we have to discuss this, because this emphasis on the U.S. just in supply just shifts uh, this problem away and creates a tremendous problem. Finally, let me, let me ask um, Ben, Ben, what do you think will happen with the technological change are we going to, to, have a, to have a chance or, uh, or we will be marginalized? So it's a good question. I think big business is going to have to digitize their business. And the business cases for digitizing the business will become easier and easier to make as, as the technologies, technologies get cheaper and the best practices are established. Businesses, big businesses are going to have a hard time changing their business models or digitizing their, digitizing their business models. So um, I, I don't have a lot of faith in, in, in big business leading the digital transformation, academia leading the digital transformation, because academia is usually set up to prioritize its students' demands and not industry demands in, in, in this region. Um, and I don't have a lot of faith in government for the many reasons that we already talked about. Um, I do think international cooperation can, can put pressure and, and help. I think the, the rule of the game for digital will probably be minimum viable ecosystems. What does that mean? <laughs> Somebody who is really good at articulating a minimum viable ecosystem around mobile payments will make it happen. And, and they'll bring in just enough banks who are proactive to do it and just enough telecom companies to make it happen. Uh, minimum viable ecosystems around e-health somebody who has the right connections to bring in just the right amount of, 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 uh, of tech entrepreneurs and uh, established health organizations. And, and But the minimum viable ecosystems that will work are the ones that connect the big guys with the little guys. If, if you think of something like retail, and but going, going back to your drug and, and violence question, extortion is a huge problem in Guatemala, um, and, and it's so many businesses shut down every single month because they are victims of extortion and, and they can't afford the payment and so and they get threatened to, to have their kids killed etc that's something that a self-employed entrepreneur cannot solve by any means by themselves because they're so isolated but big companies have the ability to say oop this guy is being extorted fast response and then within five minutes you have trace to the call of the extortion call, and then within five minutes you have three police cars outside, and so the extortionists say, I better not bother these guys anymore because they're too well connected. So I think if you, if you manage to create minimum viable ecosystems around specific needs <laughs> that link big guys with the small guys, it'll work. But it requires a, a new kind of leadership, because right now big guys want to own everything, and they're not willing to sacrifice. Thank you, Ben. Okay, we open uh, the floor uh, for questions. Ask uh, the panelists uh, any question. Who starts? And there. 
So I see you guys are serious. And uh, the question is, what are you going to do? So far, no answers, just uh, many, many explanations. Are you going to change constitutions? Are you going to legalize drugs? Or help people to defend themselves? What are you going to do? Just like anybody have an idea? What? Maybe the best question. <laughs> it's a difficult one. And if you allow me just to make one additional comment to Pedro's previous question in regarding education in Chile, very briefly. We had two social movements in education in Chile, one in 2006 during the first government of President Bachelet. It was the movement called the Pinguinos, Penguins, because the high school students, they used to dress with white shirts, black jackets, and black tie, and they were demanding for better quality of education. And we had a lot of changes in that, some in the good direction, in my view, others not necessarily, but mainly in the good direction. The second social movement was during the first government of President Piñera in 2011, and was the higher education movement. And the request at that time was free higher education. And, and why, why I'm mentioning this? Because I think the political system was not able to analyze the problem in a good way and decided to go providing free education. And that's, in my view, not reasonable for the long run of the country. We have other priorities, but the pressure was so high that we decided to spend money on that. And so there's a pressure and a challenge for governance in the way to address Pedro middle class claims and, and complaints. Let me go to some of your uh, questions. I don't like the idea of new constitutions, everyday new constitutions. I think I prefer a gradual improvement over time. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that we have more than 250 constitutions in the region, and that provides a lot of instability, and I prefer improvements of, on what we have. Uh, what to do? I think we should keep promoting sound economic policies. We should try to enhance good leaders to get together and to find different solutions. There are a couple of examples that I find positive. For example, Pacific Alliance. It's a new organization that was created between Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile. I think it was six years ago only, in 2012. And they have been working together in order to open the economies, to identify common problems, and try to address those issues with new solutions. And I, I like that kind of approach, a problem-driven approach. And I trust in the capacity of the well-prepared leaders to work together in order to do that. Re regarding to the fight on drugs, just to share a personal experience. When I read the documents, when I think about it, I understand that there are good reasons for decriminalizing. But I spent eight years in Congress, and every week I had to go to see my constituency. And Many of them in poor locations were suffering with drugs and they wouldn't understand that a politician would support the idea of decriminalizing drugs. That was at least my, my personal challenge, living the experience, besides the, the, the rational arguments that I understand and, and I think I, they need more time and debate. I think they need more time and debate. And we have to learn a little bit from the experience of Uruguay. I don't know, maybe we have someone in the audience from Uruguay. They went legalizing marijuana a couple of years ago. And so that's a place, also an experiment, where we can learn a little more on that. Um, just very quickly, I don't know if you were wondering what the new president is going to do. Uh, we have a new president for um, December 1st. I have no idea what's going to happen in Mexico. I have no idea what he will propose. But what he has been suggesting is that at least for migration management, uh, there's going to be two key dimensions, human rights and uh, development. And I think, um, I mean, it's still unclear how 
everything will be managed with future flows, with the people that are currently in Mexico waiting, many of them waiting to enter the United States. It's unclear if the refugee law will change and Mexico will sign the safe third country agreement. Uh, but I think that the explanations of what has been happening are important still to kind of like think what's going to happen next. So it's not true that Central Americans have just arrived to Mexico recently. It, I mean, it has also a long tradition of transit migration since the 1990s. Um, kind of like the explanations, I think, are important. And I think it's also important that, I mean, I've been studying return migration for the last 10 years. And in 2008, when I, when, when I started, the whole explanation was the effects of the crisis and recession and whether or not Mexicans were actually moving back to Mexico because they didn't have a job. And 10 years later, <clears throat> the explanations are, I mean, it's still unclear why Mexico migration declined so dramatically. And it was just an interplay between increasing return and decreasing immigration. Uh, but the fact is that there was also an increase of undocumented, I mean, a, an increase of documented arrivals. So an increase of H-2A visas, H-2B visas for agriculture and non-agriculture jobs. Um, and it's a clear example where there was a very important component of employers actually acknowledging the need for Mexican labor. Uh, there's, there are discussions right now of Mexican, I mean, labor shortage in the United States. And I think that we definitely, I mean, we, we definitely would like to think that in Mexico right now, we need to figure out a way for having uh, people with documented status, with work visas, or with asylum and refugee status, but also just like managing labor and, mm -hmm. and fulfilling all the shortages that we are also starting to talk about in Mexico. Claudia, plus in the last 24 months, on average, Mexico has been creating 70,000, 75,000 jobs per month. Don't forget that. You are creating 200, no, 225, more or less. We are creating one third of that. And that has helped a lot. Okay. Uh, just, and I want to return uh, the question to the new generation. I spent, I would say, more than 10 years as go government official in different posts during, during my life, trying to help to promote reforms, to do things that would change our countries. Now, I think that is the new generation challenge, but when I move from government to working in the private sector to become a, a, a regular citizen, what we have continued to try to improve is, look, there is a lot of discussion about politics, about different uh, ideologies, but what normally is lacking is two things. Concrete proposals. We have been, for example, in the Northern Triangle, proposing new models for running infrastructure in order that becomes more transparent and becomes public-private partnerships that can be construct, maintained, and operate in ways that, that, that are more sustainable. And that doesn't mean privatization. That means just managing in a way that are more sustainable and cost-efficient. Second, we have been pro proposing that the loss of building housing for our countries have to change and try to go more for the models that Chile and Mexico done 20, 30 years ago, because things change a lot when people have a house that they own. That changed a lot of the communities. And third, we have been in improving startups and, and, and the young generation leaders that want and have response or at least have some ideas of how they, have, they can improve business, they can develop the communities. But what we are seeing, and that's the reason I am returning the question, is that our new generation of well-educated people, they have so good opportunities in the private sector. They have so good opportunities in international markets that what we are lacking in, the, in, in Central America is that when we have good talent, they tend to stay outside from our countries. And because of all the corruption and 
all the bad image that the politicians have in, in the region, they don't want to be involved in the public sector and in addressing the issues in the national level. They want to solve their personal and their family issues, not the national issues. So I think that the response to your question is, it's time that the new generation takes a more active role and that we are able in our countries, for example, to have the people that are well educated to be more involved in politics and not just in business. Hello, thanks. Um, I have two questions actually. The first one's for Benjamin and Richard. Um, I believe the CP uh, model you guys have is pretty interesting, but my question would be whether is it more of like a temporary solution to the problem? Uh, because you know the <coughs> the the main problems, which are like low skill uh, labor force, you know institutions that are weak, would still be there. And I was also wondering whether this model actually creates incentives to stop uh, getting more education because you would be well off in this sort of uh, framework. That's the first question. And the second question would be for Pedro. Uh, and you talked about how demand side, uh, you know, drug uh, solutions uh, work. But uh, my question is how do you reconcile uh, this demand driven solutions with the fact that demand's global? So, as you said, it has a, a limit that is basically delimited by the region. Uh, how, like, it seems that this would require a collective action. So how would you implement this? Thanks. It's a, great, it's a great question. So the time horizon we're personally giving CEPI as a solution is about 10 to 15 years. And the narrative we're using actually in our project is we want, we need your kids to go to college because if they don't go to college, they're not going to survive in the world that's coming. But in order for them to go to college, we're going to give you 15 years of income through uh, your own business. But we're going, to, uh, we're going to demand that your kid, you have to give us your kids grades. We're monitoring chronic malnutrition. You have to take a course on how to be a good dad, a good mom every month, uh, self-esteem, et cetera. So we're taking a little bit more control of the behavioral change on, on, on the entrepreneurs themselves. And the ultimate goal is for their kids to call, go to college. So no, it's not a solution at all long term, um, but, but we're pitching it sort of as a transitionary thing for the, for the next one. Um, and you have to solve infrastructure and, and legislation. And I, what are we going to do? I, I think we need to pilot more and talk less. Um, it's particularly legislation, I think the way we legislate needs to, needs to change. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of A-B testing. Does this law work better, or, th or this regular not law, but does this regulation work better than this one? And, and let's try it in this municipality here, and this, this other one in this municipality, in order to, to generate evidence <laughs> To, to make the decisions on what's better. Um, I, don't, I think if we don't move towards A-B testing in our legislation system, uh, we're not going to be prepared at all for what's coming. Let me uh, uh, comment on, on that. We are doing two things. Uh, the first thing was in May this year. The, our Supreme Court in Mexico invited people to, to talk about the decriminalization of drugs. And uh, I present um, my, uh, my proposal, and um, last October, it was uh, law. It was, uh, it was passed for the decriminalization. We are not talking here in this first stage about legalizing. We are decriminalizing, decriminalizing uh, consumption. Why? Because if, uh, if it becomes a health, uh, a health uh, uh, public policy, then you have treatment centers. But you have to decriminalize first the consumption because if you are right to a treatment center and they put you in jail because it was uh, totally unlawful. But now with the decriminalization of the consumption side, these centers are, going, are starting to open up and people can get treatment. So I am, I'm very positive that uh, we can do it. Think about small Portugal in, in Europe. I mean, if they waited until the big guys in Germany and France, etc., they do it. No, they say, okay, we change. We go now to these things. And that's exactly what we're starting to do. It's happening. So 
I've been impressed by the fact of how little discussion there has been about education in Latin America. You know, Ernesto brought it up a little bit, and he probably should, since Chile is the only country that's been improving, or not quite. Uh, but the schooling in Latin America is not competitive worldwide. And with globalized economies and more digitalization, this seems like the long-term curse to Latin America if the quality of schools is not improved. There's essentially no overlap in math and science performance of any <coughs> Latin American country with any European country. Um, and without addressing that, it's hard to imagine that the growth rates in Latin America will improve. Yeah, let me, let me, let me answer first uh, uh, a good example of, uh, of this in, uh, in Mexico. Many years ago, when we negotiated, we negotiated the, the free trade agreements with, uh, with the US and Canada, and then with uh, many other uh, uh, countries, we have 40 uh, free trade agreements. Uh, let, me, let me tell you something that we did that I think addressed that problem. <coughs> we look at uh, how many uh, engineers we were um, um, graduating from, uh, from universities <coughs> in Mexico. And, um, and uh, per capita, we were 70% per capita below the US. And we put, uh, we put uh, uh, an objective for 15 years to reach the same level per capita. And, um, and we, we got it. In fact, we got it in 12 years. You know how many engineers we are graduating now? A very small economy relative to yours. We are almost at par. We are graduating every year 170,000 engineers. That answers your question? Well, not, not quite, with all due respect. I mean, coming back to what Ben was talking about too, everybody goes to university. The schools that are feeding into the engineering programs are not up to international competitive standards. Mm -hmm. And so then you end up with engineers that have the degrees, but that they are not internationally competitive. Very, very good answer. Sorry that it, that it doesn't uh, reach my level of satisfaction. Uh, we have the largest Nissan factory in the world outside Japan in Mexico. We have the second largest BMW uh, factory. We have the third largest Mercedes-Benz. Ask me, do they bring foreign engineers in the Mexican plants? No, sir. They are Mexican engineers. Okay, just a couple of comments. Yeah. Professor Hanusik, you, you're an expert and, and you know that we have a huge challenge in, in Latin America. Let me just point out a couple of things for Chile. I'm very optimistic for the future, but I'm really concerned with education. That's pointed out in my paper in two aspects. First, the quality of education and mainly schooling in, in schools. Because the students that we are receiving at college level are not very well prepared, as you just mentioned, at least in my country. I'm not aware on the details of every country on the continent, but for a country that has been performing very well in several indicators, our educational levels in coverage are very good, in quality are really bad. Number two, our debates in higher education are more in the area of who is providing the education, the private sector, the public sector, instead, and who is financing the education, instead of debating what should we do. A couple of examples of, of, on that. We still have five or six year programs in undergraduate level. We should have three or four years with different avenues for the future and possibility of, of changing over time. That debate has been postponed and, and we have to move fast. And I connect that challenge to the problem of uh, middle class challenging the authorities for faster solution for their problems. And the cost of higher education, of course, is high and it has been increasing. It's an industry where you have a lot of accreditations, regulations, 
And the only way to get through those processes is with more human capital and more research, and that costs a lot. And if you want the government to finance that and everything, it's going to be impossible. And so in my view, at least for Chile, the debate on education has not been centered on the main issues. And those issues are the quality of the teachers in, in schools, the diversity of the education offer, and we're we are moving in the opposite direction, trying to get everyone in the same model, and that's bad. And in higher education, as I mentioned before, not only discussing about the financing and who is the provider, but how to open different alternatives and paths for students in order to look for their future. If you go to PISA, teams are other international standardized tests. Latin America is behind. And of course, that's a relevant challenge that has a huge impact also in productivity. And that also is connected with some level of incapacity of getting the opportunity of the digital transformation. If, if I can add to, I think your question is super critical. In our case, it hits us very hard because if we want to generate one million university students, we have to we have to generate the whole feeder system into that. Um, and, and this is very difficult. We won't have time to go into detail, but I think one thing that's helpful is to separate the public school system from the private school system. I think on the private school system, uh, there's a lot you can do around micro franchising, around bringing uh, starting from daycare centers all the way up. Uh, they're bringing best practices. There's already a huge install base of very poor private schools, but the parents are paying. So at scale, you might be able to improve teacher training platforms, um, school administration, student uh, parent engagement platforms, student learning platforms, etc. It's a whole different ball of wax than than the public school system because there you have a lot of interests, uh, special interests, uh, labor. Uh, teacher labor unions, et cetera, involved in the process that make it very, very difficult to do the reforms that you need to do. Um, so, but right now what we're doing is replacing our bet on let's get 2,500 private schools, which already exist, uh, to enroll in sort of a best practice franchise kind of thing. Let me add something very quickly for Mexico as well. Uh, so at uh, Colegio de Mexico, we just produced a report on inequality. And uh, I think, I mean, there are different messages, but one message is that we see a convergence down in terms of earnings. So over time, those that who were earning, I mean, those with uh, undergraduate degrees actually reduced their salaries about 30%, which is very, very um, wor worrisome. But we also see this convergence down and closing the gap uh, because of the deterioration of, of those on the top in terms of learning skills and grades and PISA. And I think this again talks about the need for, for, for improving our educational systems, although you also need to think that a first step maybe was just improving coverage and that we have been good at it, and now we are actually looking at uh, steps further into that. Uh, but we do acknowledge uh, from these studies at Colmex that it's, it's worrisome that all these inequalities actually add up over time in your life and end up um, Showing in the, I mean, uh, uh, over time, just like great, uh, greater gaps and wedding gaps. There is agreement that education is the key for development. And the important thing is how fast you can do it. Thank you very much for attending.